And we're playing Floored Bauer. 11, 12, and let's go for another Danish Gambit. Let's go for another Danish Gambit. Oh, and we've faced this once before, guys. That is not good. That is not good at all. And you guys know why by now. If he takes, he's busted. He probably will recognize it. Oh, God. Oh, no. We've done that actually once before. Yeah, this is Damiano without the Knight Sacrifice. In the Damiano, we have the same position in the absence of the G1 Knight. Here, we have the Knight on the board, and we win the Rook in the game. We are literally following the game that we had previously. Yeah. And I'm not commentating this because <laughs> it's pretty evident. Yeah, he's busted. Boom. Goodbye. Knight is hanging. He moves his king. We can get this guy. Let's get this baby out to c4. Yeah, it's over. Yeah, okay, I'm playing another one. And we are 1100. So you guys can see the Danish game, but I mean, it's people below 13, 1400 really don't know what to do against it. And, um,. Yeah, f6, uh, d takes c5. Now at this point, if you blundered something like this, and that's another thing that I wanna make clear. One of the key uh, abilities that you can cultivate as early as beginner level is you recognize, oh my God, I played this move. Don't be embarrassed, but try to make the most of the situation. Let's say you were black and you wanted to make the most of the situation. What would you do? How does black avoid getting an immediately lost position? You don't need to play queen e7, right? That's a bit of a panicky reaction. Simply knight c6, exactly. Knight c resign, that's a great call. Knight c6. And get white to take the pawn. So at least you get your knights out. You've got a reasonable position here, actually. So that's uh, something that you could do. Um, where? d6 where? Yeah, okay. Um, so anyways, guys, we'll get one more game in. All right, well, we got another white game against uh, Luca de Aborta. Now, we've we haven't faced, I think, a single move other than e5. Sure, all right. No freaking way. I swear these are not paid actors. Th there is no way that this is happening again. Oh, my lands. Oh my lands. Oh my lands. <laughs> you can't script this. Oh my god. That's crazy. And here we're up a, qu a rook and a piece in an end game. I'm gonna go knight d5 and go after his pawn. That's insane. The Danish can't be beat. You guys should be taking it up right about now. If you're in this rating range, you don't need a GM to deliver these moves, but let's stay on task. I'm just going to complete my development in Castle. I'm not even commentating these moves. I'm just developing. Yeah, Castles. Now, okay. Nitpicky question, what should we do? Nitpicky question, what should we do? Yeah, I'll show you guys what to do at some point. Take and simplify. What should we take with? If you've got good, ta good tactical vision, you will see that upon taking, you create the possibility of a discovered uh, check. And the best way to pave the way for that is to take with a bishop and not with a knight. Because it doesn't matter here because we're up so many pieces, but if you take with a knight and he takes with a pawn, he attacks the bishop, which dilutes the effectiveness of a discovered check. Here you can give it on b6 and take the rook on a8. And remember when I was training QT Cinderella, she would do something like knight takes c7 here, which is the right idea, but th this, be careful that you don't allow a piece that's um, that's in a discovered check, like, I mean the king, uh, to move away from the discovered check and take the piece that's trying to, uh, you know what I'm saying, like trying to make the rook. Okay, I'm going to go a4 here. I'm going to try to uh, get the bishop out to b5, check. And... Okay, again, I'm not even commentating this. I'm just going to try to, I'm just going to try to mate with a pawn. C3, B4, mate. 
Yeah, that's me. I have a nice mate, I gotta say. What, what, what an amazing mate. Okay. So, we, we gotta get one more after this one. That was ridiculous. Um, nothing to commentate here. We just develop our pieces. But notice that I'm developing my pieces. Like, all I'm doing after I win all this is just to develop my pieces and centralize my knight. So, the paradoxical thing is that uh, the vast majority of the time, I'm actually not playing too creatively or too aggressively. I'm, I'm following the rules. Most of the time, I'm following the rules. Um, but the times when you don't follow the rules are what makes chess such a magical game. Okay. What happens if he just brings out knight after our first two pawn moves? Well, we face that. Like, we face knight c6 a couple of times, and we take on e5. And if he goes knight f6 which we have faced once, we get this position. And I think that bishop c4, we face this as well. So that'll be all on YouTube. We got to get one more game. And guys, this is getting ridiculous. <laughs> Atanas, he's Armenian player, 11-10. Well, let's go. d5, facing d4 for the first time. Now, there are many openings that we could play. We've been playing the Queen's Gambit Declined, but I would like to introduce you guys to the, to the Nimzo Indian here. Okay, the Nimzo Indian, I would say, along with the Queen's Gambit Decline, is among the most solid and reputable positional openings you could play. And in the Nimzo, you play Bishop B4. And I'll talk a little bit about the nomenclature um, after the game. But you see what happens at this level. People aren't prepared for it. He goes E4. Reasonable move. He controls the center. He doesn't understand, he, you know, he doesn't ask himself what was the point of Bishop B4, though, which was to pin the knight. What should we do? Thank you, Blagomir. I really appreciate it. Now, some of you are making an instructive mistake. You don't need to take on c3 first. You just eat the pawn. It is far more flexible to do this. Maybe later you'll take on c3 with the bishop, but also maybe not. You're actually in. There we go. Now we take with a knight, and we've already basically won the game. So, if you... And this is... Hopefully, I'm justifying something I've been saying for a long time, which is that... There is a myth that circulates around many corners of chess coaching. I believe it's a myth. And I believe that this myth says, essentially, that you don't need to do openings if you're like under 1600. Hopefully I'm showing that if you do do openings um, below 1600, the, the benefits that you can reap from that, all right? Now, what should we do? And here we need to be careful. He doesn't take the knight back. Clearly, we don't actually even really need to move the knight, but, but let's move it just for clarity. And when you're talking about a discovered check, you just need to brute force it. Look at every square that the knight can go to and figure it out. Well, knight takes a2 comes to mind. That's, that's a pretty good pawn. But then he goes bishop to d2, right? He goes bishop to d2, and we're, we're going to have to deal with that knight and evacuate it. There is a more classy move. Okay, knight a4 check, does that do anything? Nah, not, not really, right? Knight d5 check, not really, not really. Knight e2, knight d1, blunder, blunder the knight. But what about knight b5 check? Wait a second, let's think about that for a second. Oh, that attacks d4. So not only do we win a pawn, but we also evacuate and recentralize the knight. Brute force method, we just didn't, okay, so first let's, let's take, drag his king out, and now we take on d4. So sometimes when you've got a discovered check, literally brute force it look at every legal move every legal discover check um that doesn't take that long it, it sounds very cumbersome but it's it's not at all in many cases all right so this one is basically over okay he's attacking two pieces at the same time pawn in the night what do we do yeah queen f6 Boom, boom, simple defensive move. Knight f5 would not be as effective. He would take that knight. Okay, knight f3. Here, I'm not going to ask you guys. I think it's pretty pretty obvious that we can take the knight and snag another pawn on b2. This is a great application of the concept that we don't need to always go crazy about queen trade. Lots about the knight. Um, one more up material. If an opportunity to attack or to win more material presents itself, there's no reason not to go for it. Now, if he goes rook b1 here, which I think he will, and I think he'll do it probably with this rook. Now, I know these players pretty well by now. <laughs> I can see the wheels turning in his head. Um, what should we do now? So now we have a, what, what a 
I would call a simplifying combination. We have a simplifying combination. How do we find it? A lot of you guys are seeing it. Knight d4 would be a fork. Boom. This is very rudimentary stuff. Knight d4 check and knight takes f3. We simplify by trading queens in a pair of minor pieces and we ruin a structure. Now, what should we do with this bishop? Hey, Dunlops. What would be the most efficient way of developing this bishop? And this is very common in the Nimzo. It is very common in the Nimzo because when we play e6, we create a pawn chain that often makes it hard to develop the bishop along the standard route. So not only do we feel in Keto, let's bring it to a6 so it skewers the pawn to the king, acting on that skewer with d5 and winning the pawn. Now this is all kind of pedantic at this point because we're so winning. But, okay, let's go c5. Let's push this one in. He's probably going to go king e5, and then he's going to get checkmated there. Um, how? Now, this is instructive. What do we do? How do we actually mate him or set up the mate? All right. Good job, king e7. Now, he can play f5 and prolong the game. I hope he doesn't. Yeah. Mate with a pawn again. So, Nimzo Indian, ladies and gentlemen. A little bit of chess history. Who was the first person to play the Nimzo Indian? Was it, in fact, Aaron Nimzovich? So, a word on the nomenclature. I know this confuses a lot of people. This is the Nimzo Indian, okay? Nimzo Indian depends on white playing knight c3. If white does not play knight c3, you will not have a Nimzo Indian, okay? Um, so, it was first played in the year 1851 by Bonerji, Indian player Mohishundar Bonerji against British player John Cochran. And um, it was played by Nimzovich, but Nimzovich was only the seventh player to play the Nimzo Indian. And Alakine against Rubenstein played the Nimzo Indian in the very same tournament one round before. So maybe there was a little bit of plagiarism going on. I think we're uncovering something kind of interesting here. In 1914, at a tournament in St. Petersburg, Alakine played the Nimzo Indian in uh, round five against Rubenstein. Only the sixth player to do so, and the seventh player to do so was the day after that with Nimzovich. Very interesting stuff going on. Okay, anyways. It's called the Nimzo Indian also because Aaron Nimzovich analyzed this in his books. Um, now, white can go knight f3. And in this position, there are many systems. You can play the Queen's Indian. I've played that. That's b6. You can play the Rogozin. So you can play d5. And now bishop e7 transposes to the uh, Queen's Gambit declined. That's also possible, but the Rogozin is bishop b4 here. I know that this is confusing. You guys be like, wait a minute. Isn't this the Nimzo Indian? Well, not quite, because you have the addition of these two moves. All right. So... And finally, white has the Catalan, and that is g3 in this position, the dreaded Catalan. And again, there's a million systems here. Usually white starts with knight f3, um, and, and I'm not going to delve into them. Okay. So Rogozin after Vyacheslav Rogozin, yeah. Okay, so here he plays the Nimzo, and e4 is a mistake. Now, the Nimzo Indian is an opening that bases its... Um, effectiveness on and I don't want to keep citing that but hypermodern principles yes because black only controls a little bit of the center and in fact black refrains from d5 a lot of the time instead preferring to fianchetta the bishop and what I want you guys to see let's say that white plays kind of normally look at how much of a central control black pieces have the knight and the bishop both staring at e4 um, and doing it from a distance and one of the beautiful things about the nimzo is that in, you often get in situations where every single piece is um, coordinated in a subtle way with the other pieces and not none of the pieces are interfering with each other. Like bishop is controlling the open diagonal, knights are connected, pawns are nice and solid, and this bishop doing some pressuring on the queen side. So it is um, a very harmonious opening and that's why it's withstood the test of time and it remains, uh, you know, one of the best openings in general. All right. Um, now, our opponent blundered very quickly, knight takes c3, and everything else was very, very simple. All right. Any questions? What is it? Oh, good question. What exactly is a system, and how does it differ from a setup? So, um, a system 
in relation to a chess opening, like the London system, um, the King's Indian attack is also a system. I prefer the use of, of system to refer specifically to a set of moves that you make virtually against every response by the opponent. Okay, the London system is a system because within reasonable limits, now you're like e5, you wouldn't play bishop f4, but against most moves you play the same general system. Um, in the King's Indian attack, it's much the same thing. And, uh, you know, so I would actually think that's a pretty good um, way of thinking about certain openings, like which openings are more systematic. Uh, some openings are more systematic than other openings, all right? Um, like King's Indian for black is a pretty si pretty systematic, I wouldn't call it a system, but it's a, it's a pretty systematic opening. Um, so that's just uh, all I would say. And a setup isn't really a formal opening word kind of thing. All right. And this goes to why I think the London does hinder a beginner's development. Because when you play a pure system opening, you literally play the same moves against everything. You don't expand your, um, you know, your circle of understanding. That's the bottom line here. Okay. Well, you know what I have to say here. Well, I'm tempted to do one more. Okay. Let's do it. Last one. But this this is the actual last one. Because I got to sleep before my commentary. All right. And we got Lad 55, Russian player. Now we're getting serious. And let's go for another Karokan. It's a knight f3 this time. d5 doesn't change what we do. Last game chat. e5. All right. So this is uh, possible. and But because he's played the knight uh, to f3, he's given us the extra option of bringing the bishop out to g4, which is generally not, um, not possible. Um, uh, because because the queen controls that square. Is it worth it? Yeah, I think it's worth it. Why not? Why not? Uh, bishop g4 set seems like a great improvement even to bishop f5. Thank you, Boomerhausen, for the prime. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And what should we do now, guys? Whoa, we got a dono. Three bucks from Amir uh, Karabek. Thank you so much. The way you explain everything is so clear and clever. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, e6. The fact that he's playing this passively doesn't change, doesn't alter what we do. What now? So remember, knight d7 is possible, but not strictly necessary. Instead, we can go c5 and then go knight c6. That is the optimal way of developing. What do we do now? What's the thematic move? Yeah, we take, all right? It's time to take because already We've destroyed, virtually destroyed his pawn chain. And we can take on d4 immediately, but <clears throat> the classy move is to play knight c6 to withhold, withhold that. Let him do the taking, trading on our own terms again. Ryan gifting to Zephyri. And look at how now our bishop has developed. His pawn is still very weak. We're going to win that pawn. In fact, he doesn't put up any resistance. We're just going to take it. All right. Bishop e2. What do we do now? Yeah, queen a5 was fine. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Don't have to reinvent the wheel, knight f6. Okay, so he he wants b4. And because we're playing this very positionally, um, now we could play a5 here and stop it. But we don't actually need to do that because b4 is not dangerous. We can just move our bishop. And another thing that players that, you know, this level don't always factor in are, are squares. I've talked about weak squares already, right? What square does this weaken? And where should we put our bishop? Now we can put it on d6 or b6. Both are good. I like putting it on d6. Yeah, look at this juicy, juicy square. The reason we put it on d6 is very simple. After he plays, okay. Had he played bishop b2, he would not have been attacking our knight. And now we have also a more aggressive plan connected with building a battery here. But 
in the name of positional chess, how do we increase our control over the c4 square? Rook c8. But before we even do that, let me really um, annoy you guys. We can improve the situation on the queen side in a way that we've done before. I've made this move before. This pawn sticks out like a sore thumb. When I see this construction, I immediately start thinking of undermining, right? And when you undermine stuff, you try to break down this pawn structure. It's very vulnerable because he hasn't completed his development. Boom. He's in a lose-lose spot. If he takes, ugh, if he goes b5, well, that creates another hole on c5, that pawn on a3, because his entire position just sort of starts to crumble a little bit further. And if he goes c3, well, then he pays the price for not having developed the knight. His rook is undefended. A takes b4, c takes b4, and I've shown you guys this before. Bishop takes b4. Um, so he takes. Well, now we can bring the queen out, right? And perhaps we can even bring the other rook to c8 so that the, uh, the a8 rook is now um, fulfilling a pretty important role. Okay, bishop d2. Where should we put our queen? Every one of these decisions may seem insignificant, but it's important. And we have to keep our eyes on the prize. We know what we want. We want to increase our hold over, C over uh, c4. Um, and we also want to potentially pressure the pawn. So queen c7 it is. All right, I did kind of overlook knight c3, which would aim for b5, it's not an issue though. But the, yeah, knight c3 he played. Now, I actually will be honest with you guys, I, I didn't realize that this comes with tempo and I, I really don't want to part ways with this bishop. I really don't want to part ways with this bishop. Okay. Why? Why don't I, why don't I want to part ways with it? Well, let me write this down. Um, why not allow knight b5? But one of them is that the bishop is is the instrument that allows us to attack the pawn, and it's just the glue guy. The bishop is the glue guy. Rook a5 is um, not effective because he still goes knight b5. That bishop defends the square. If we take on a3. We still allow him to play knight b5, and I, it gets complicated. You guys should be able to see that. So what do we do? Are we, are we busted here? No, we're not. Uh, we just need to take the opposite perspective. We're looking at this from the angle of physically stopping knight b5, but let's take the sting out of it. Let's take the sting out of it. What that means is moving one of these two pieces so that knight b5 doesn't act as kind of a soft fork. And we want to take this thing out of it, preferably without ruining the placement of the pieces, maybe even improving it. And bishop e7 would worsen the situation of the bishop, but bishop c5 would not. All right, hope the logic makes sense. We could have also, the other move I thought of, yeah, queen e7 or queen c6. And you guys see how effective this thinking is. We just go queen c6, we're good, our bishop is still great. And this knight is now dangling on b5, doing absolutely nothing. Okay, he supports it with a4. In fact, not only is it doing nothing, but when a move like that is made, I consider its drawbacks. What squares does it no longer control? Again, always asking yourself that question when a piece goes to this, from the center to the side of the board, it relinquishes control of certain squares. Not a4, sorry guys. I meant the move knight b5. Right, knight e4, centralizing. Thank you, Tommy, I really appreciate it. It's very sweet. All right. Okay. So, bishop e3. Now, I said that we don't want to part ways with our bishop. That was true then. That was then, this is now, and the circumstances have changed. He's offering us a much better deal. We can ruin his structure, weaken his king, create an isolated pawn and get rid of his dark squared bishop. I'm fine with that. HP, now it's the thing with the prime. Here, um, I think some of you might be thinking of moves like knight g3. We don't need to decide on that yet. We can make a general improving move. What gen Yeah, we can go knight c3 trade. Oh, that's a good move. That's a fantastic move, actually. Good thinking, guys. Trading his strongest piece Yes, for our strongest piece, true. But remember, we've also got the other centralized knight. So it's not a, you know, he's only got one good piece. We've got a bunch of good pieces. So this, this makes a lot of sense. Perfect. Curious to Tommy, thank you. Queen attacking the pawn. 
No, we're not concerned about the F out. And again, I hearken you back to the worst case scenario test. Even if we allowed him to do everything he wanted, how could he possibly have enough firepower to attack this pawn? So here, we want to be clinical. Okay, he's just giving us the pawn. We can go queen e3 and take with the pawn, but I actually like taking it with the pawn because this creates a far advanced passer and it opens the d-file. Who's going to control that default? It's definitely going to be us. Okay. So open files are overrated. I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. I, I'm going to talk about a very important concept afterwards. Sent in Adono again? Damn, girl. Another three. I run a startup out of UC Berkeley. Nice. Nice. Okay. So which rook should we go to d8 with? Which rook should we go to d8 with? Yeah, the rook on f8 lends some support to the f1. Why risk it? Why risk it? Um, let's go with the uh, the a rook, okay? Now, there's a, d a distinction to be made between like things that you know are going to happen versus things that you're doing just to be safe. This is something you're doing to be safe. Probably nothing would have happened if we'd gone rook f d8. But I just want to make sure that, that this rook uh, supervises this for abundance of sake. Okay, so he attacks the queen. Okay. Um, where should we go? We can offer a queen trade, but if we're offering a queen trade, we better do it actively. Boom, queen d2. Fine, take our queen. But you're going to be making our rook incredibly active. Look at how it connects with our previous move. We could have also gone queen c5 check. That would have been fine as well. There were alternatives. There were alternatives. No, I, I usually like your moves. It attacks the bishop. And now we need to start thinking a little bit about how to improve the position further. Well, it stems logically from the fact that we have a bunch of extra pawns. Most of them are on the king side. We should probably consider pushing them. We can't push e3, and nor do we need to. We can actually snag a third pawn, but we don't even need to do that. Let's get down to business to defeat the Huns. Yeah, rook fd8 is possible, but we can play more directly. We can play more directly. We have a bunch of these pawns. At some point, you can just say, all right, I'm just going to start pushing these guys. And look at how our knight is right in the center. It's completely dominating over the bishop. Um, f4. Now, you don't just want to put your head down, literally just like um, willy-nilly, helter-skelter, go crazy. In fact, you want to, uh, you want to uh, exercise tremendous degree of caution. What is the idea of rook c3? Where is this rook potentially going? Let's play this without giving him any chances at all. Zero. It's maybe going to c5, and I don't want to leave. I don't want this knight to leave e5. Bingo, prophylaxis. B town pro, thank you. These moves drive your opponent crazy. All right. Um, he can go to c7, but that, that doesn't do anything. That one rook in isolation is going to accomplish nothing. And I know that that might not be obvious. Uh, but if you look at it more carefully, what is it even going to threaten? He's probably going to go here, yes. But this comes in way too late. What can we do now? Yeah, it is acceptable once you have an endgame. We can just keep pushing, right? And which of these should we keep pushing? So you guys are thinking of defending the pawn, but look at how far these are advanced. Yeah, just F3. I mean, the game is over. The game is over because we're just going to take this pawn. We're actually going for checkmate. We're not necessarily only going for promotion. We're also going for checkmate. And yeah. So like, okay, he takes, that's a good move. Now we take, and now we need one final maneuver to win the game. Now we don't want to move the knight. We really don't want to move the knight because if we do, um, if we do, then, then we drop the e4 pawn, not a disaster. So how can we, um, Prevent that from, bingo, okay, five, simple. Making sure that this isn't made, you know, king f7, yeah. And now this rook, we notice the fact that his king is out of squares. Our mating sort of detection patterns begin to activate. And we notice that we can, okay, so he blunders, just gives us this. Um, that would be the best option. Rook h5 would have been the idea, yes. So the funny thing is, a good way to practice the Sam Shanklin question, right? A lot of people have the instinct of moving the knight. 
This is where my instinct from you guys are, is different. My instinct is not to move the knight, but to first check whether I can play rook h5 anyway. And I can. And it's not hard to calculate this. Rook d7, king e6. And mate is unstoppable. Not because you're attacking white's rook, but because even if you weren't, it would be unstoppable. Yeah. But it's a good practice to move the king closer to the center. Making sure there is no stalemate because he's got pawn moves at his disposal. Just something to note to yourself. And the game is over. Okay. That was a good opponent. We're, we're getting up there. So e5, e5, bishop g4, blah, blah, blah. So c5, we do all the normal Karakon things. Um, bishop c5. The first part of the game should be very, very clear to everybody. Okay, so we allow b4. And I think that some players also have this extreme where they either try to prevent every single threat or they don't look for threats. Sometimes you say, okay, b4 is his idea, but I'm going to allow it. There's no need to stop everything your opponent wants to do. Sometimes it makes more harm than good. Okay, bishop d6. Um, a5 should make sense to everybody, right? A5 should make sense to everybody. Takes, takes. Um, queen c7, dropping it back. Now, if I had seen this, maybe I'd have gone queen b6, but it doesn't really matter. Now, bishop c5, getting the bishop out of the... Um, out of the range of the knight, I am Bowen Mang. Thank you for the gift to fast Eric. Queen c6. Please explain a5. Well, I did that during the game. To recap, a5 is called undermining. Undermining is when you essentially um, try to force him to push a pawn, and in doing so, to create further structural and positional weaknesses. What does that mean? Well, think about it this way. The move b5... It extends the influence of the bishop. It weakens the c5 square. And just visually, it softens up the entire queen set. And if he doesn't take a5, then we take b4 and we win a pawn. All right? Could we have went d4 with the bishop? Oh, well, but the queen guards that square. Right? Or is that not the moment at which you wanted to do that? So does that make sense? Let's move a5. Now, don't over-apply this, but that's the point. Okay, so boom, boom, boom. Knight e4, centralizing. Okay. Why spend moves undermining the side of the castle? To the well, the answer is that you don't you win a chess game ultimately through checkmate. But you, you can attack the side of the board um, opposite his king, right? That's called a queenside attack. And that's perfectly... Otherwise, the king's Indian would just be losing for white because white attacks on the opposite side of the board so the and the end result of that is just to win material on that side or to blast things open right by definition um, those kinds of attacks are harder to execute often than king side than attacks on the king because you can't quite notice your target what makes people uncomfortable about these kinds of attacks is the abs the seeming absence of a target um, when you're attacking the king you know exactly um, uh, what you're attacking, when you attack the opposite side of the board, you don't really know what you're doing or what you're going for, and you should abstract that a little bit. You shouldn't be thinking of it in terms of one target. You should be thinking of it as sort of a side of the board. You're trying to either create weaknesses or win material. You don't always need a specific target. Okay, so knight e4, bishop e3. Now we trade his strongest piece, and d takes e4. Everything we did was very straightforward here. I didn't make a single move that should be confusing. If any of them were, please ask me to explain. Now b6, unnecessary, but kind of nice. Prophylaxis preventing him from going rook c5. And that's the top computer move, guys, actually. That is the top computer move. Computers think prophylactically all the time. And I can, I reckon my, I reckon my um, accuracy here is pretty high, actually. Let's check. Um, not to like, not trying to toot my own horn here, but like, what I want to show is to the contrary. I want to show you that you were able to come up with all of these moves as well. Yeah, good 96. So you don't need to play extraordinary chess to play a good game. Okay. I will too, my horn. That was a really nice game. All right. Um, of course, if you had played queen e7 before knight b5, would you have played bishop a3? Well, here's the thing. Um, if we take on a3... And after knight b5, the, you can play like this, yes, 
But I would go so far as to say I did not want to give up the bishop even for another pawn. Even for another pawn. Um, because he can go something like queen b1. And he's attacking b7 and he's threatening the skewer. And this creates some confusion. So I feel like that uh, would not be worth my while. All right. Okay. 